Your wife told me about it. Okay, come on, Jim. You got to give us a little more than that. Where did she hear about it? Paw Paw Fanatics. Oh, excellent. That's great. Great, Bill. Thank you. That means you all are into the Paw Paws. Ah, oh, good. Paw Paw Growers Association. So for those of you who want to know more about Paw Paws, there is an association. There's also a Paw Paw Festival in Southern Ohio. And I know Kentucky is one of our states who does a great job with Paw Paws. So, Dr. Matt Davies, are you back? I am back. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our introduction. And when we get to you, we'll ask you just to pull your screen up already. Okay. So, welcome, everybody. We're thrilled to have you here tonight. Uh, we are excited about presenting tonight's program, Powerful Paw Paws. I don't know how many of you know about Paw Paws. It's one of the in my opinion, one of the prettiest flowers in a flowering tree, but it's something you got to be looking for. And I'm sure Dr. Davies is going to tell us how to look for those flowers and when. Um, just a little bit about Chadwick Arboretum and Learning Gardens. This is our Tree University series. We have something every month. Chadwick is a 62-acre laboratory at The Ohio State University. We've got a lot of things to offer. If you can get to campus, please come and see our Arboretum our green roof, we have the catch and release lake. We also have our cultivar trials, several theme gardens, a labyrinth, and watch for information on our winter solstice walk that will be coming up in December. And Chadwick is all about volunteers and wouldn't exist without the help of our great volunteers. At the bottom there, you can see the Chadwick Arboretum website. And if you'd like more information about Chadwick and some of our programs, please go right to that site. Chadwick's got a lot of activities going on right now. Of course, the last couple days with the rain and the chilly weather, we've had to cancel some of our volunteer activities. But we have a very small staff now that our interns have gone back to school. But we have absolutely incredible volunteers, all of those wearing the red shirts that are just fantastic. In the middle, we have Zoe, who's going to do a walk in the, uh, I think this week, about um, grazing in the woodlands, what kinds of things you can eat. And I believe she has some things in her hands there, chestnuts, uh, some things that you can eat while you're in the woodlands. And again, more information on that at our website. Julia put this slide in together, our slide in today for our football season here, Go Bucks. And she's also got these wonderful Buckeyes on the far right hand side. And horse chestnuts will give you the same similar color of fruit, but just a little picture of one of the Buckeyes that most likely by this weekend we'll be stripped of all the buckeyes because people love to hunt buckeyes and make their favorite buckeye necklaces for the game next month on october 21st from 6 to 7 p.m our tree university is investing in trees for health safety and equity and we have a special guest rosalie hendon who is a program manager at columbus recreation and parks and we're excited to have her you can see the website there uh, go.osu.edu slash Columbus Trees to sign up for next month's session. A couple of housekeeping things to keep in mind. We will enter all questions. We'll ask you to enter your questions into the Q&A box. If you look at the bar, either at the top of your screen or the bottom, where you see the mute, the stop video, participants, chat, Q&A, use that Q&A box for your questions. We'll ask Dr. Davies to answer some of these questions at the end, given time, if we have enough time. Um, and he'll answer your questions there. We will not go through the chat box for questions because many times they get kind of lost in the mix. The chat box is open if you want to chat to other people or comment or say, great job, Dr. Davies. You can chat to each other. The chat box is open and available. But please, again, do not put questions in the chat box. Thank you for joining us this evening. And I am going to turn this over to one of our incredible volunteers, Mark DeBard, who is going to introduce our speaker. Mark? Thank you, Pam. So our speaker tonight is Dr. Matt Davies. Uh, he's got a very interesting uh, biography. He uh, did his uh, bachelor's and master's works at the University of Wales uh, and his PhD from the University of Edinburgh in 2006 with a thesis on fire behavior and its impact on the Heather Moorlands. 
He did a lot of field work after that, including in the state of Washington, went back and got post-grad certification from Glasgow in 2013, and has been at Ohio State since 2015 as an associate professor now at OSU School of Environment and Natural Resources. He's published tons of stuff, 36 scientific papers when I last checked, a couple of book chapters, research reports he presents at conferences and seminars. He's a academic editor for Peer J, an open access journal, a subject about which he appears to be very enthusiastic. Uh, he has multiple research areas that include uh, the restoration of terrestrial ecosystems, post-disturbance vegetation and community dynamics, the use of fire as a management and restoration tool, peatland vegetation and carbon dynamics, and the adaptive management of trade-offs between ecosystem services during restoration. Here at OSU, he chairs the Environment and Natural Resources Graduate Studies Committee, and he's led seven different courses, including a newly developed ecosystem restoration curriculum for undergraduate students. He earned the Collaborator of the Year Award from Chadwick Arboretum's director in 2019. <clears throat> and finally, uh, it was fun. Uh, you can find online student comments about uh, the teachers nowadays. Yeah. So uh, yes, I did find a few, Dr. Davies. Uh, my favorite ones uh, described him as precious, witty, passionate, a gem, having boundless knowledge and caring about his students. So let's welcome this famous gem as our speaker tonight, Dr. Matt Davies. Thanks, Mark, for the great introduction. And Matt, if you would like to go ahead and start sharing your sp screen, we'll make sure you're up and running. Okay. I think I've mounted uh, So I currently have uh, a message saying, oh, okay, now I'm allowed to start my, I didn't have permission. Uh, currently it's saying, I can't share my screen. It says host has disabled participant screen sharing. So. So Julia, it has you listed as host. Can you ask, <clears throat> allow him to share? Okay, that's good. We got it. All right, can everybody see that okay? Perfect. All right, well, um, thank you to you both for that uh, generous introduction. Mark, you've, you've broken my golden rule, which is, I, I don't know whether you pulled that stuff off uh, Rate My Professors or something, but I, um, I swore to myself I would never ever look at that website. <laughs> you, you know, I never looked at them either, but it is fun. <laughs> All right, so maybe, maybe I should go and check it out now. I know it's not all terrible. Um, yeah, thank you, for, thank you for having me here. I'm, uh, I love Chadwick Arboretum a lot. Um, it's such a great place, so I would just plug it again. If you do have an interest in trees or, or gardening or ecosystem restoration, um, they're a wonderful organization and uh, could uh, very definitely use more volunteer help. Um, we teach a class out there currently We've been teaching out there for a couple of years, doing uh, invasive species control and prairie restoration and woodland restoration out there. And we're just so fortunate to have the Arboretum and all its wonderful staff and, and volunteers um, who, uh, who really have supported my, my teaching and my work a huge amount. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you for a little while about uh, pawpaws. And as Mark explained, I'm not, not originally from um, the US. Uh, so pawpaws were pretty new to me when I moved to uh, Ohio uh, six years or so ago. Um, and really, I, I came across them and got into them purely by chance uh, when I had an undergraduate student um, called Libby Brigner, who originally was going to go and work at the Olentangy wetlands here in Columbus. Uh, she was interested in honeysuckle in invasion and its control. She went out there and uh, she came back really enthusiastic to my office and said, is it okay if I change my project? I went out and there's all these pawpaw trees out of the wetlands and very few of them have any fruit on and I wanna try and figure out why. So my response was, okay, well, I've been, I've been here about three months by that point. And I was like, okay, well, first question, what is a pawpaw? And, uh, and second question, can you show me what they look like? And so she explained all about them as a fruit, you know, the Ohio state native fruit um, and, uh, we went out and we, we planned this project to try and figure out flowering and uh, fruiting success in woodland pawpaw. And I had to wait like uh, six, seven months 
before I got uh, my first taste of a pour pour and, and thereafter was hooked. And with some collaboration from a whole bunch of different people, including some folk listed here, Sarah Francino, who's a graduate student that works with me, um, Brad Bergerford and, and Joe Sheeran's uh, um, colleagues in the horticulture and crop science department, and uh, Ron Powell, who is uh, with the leads the Ohio Pour Pour Growers Association. Uh, a few years down the line, and we've had a number of uh, projects from, funded by the Ohio Department of Agriculture and the, and the USDA to look at uh, increasing pro production of pawpaw and uh, trying to get expand the opportunities for, for marketing them. So I'll talk a little bit about our research today and some of the things that we found out. Um, there will be some figures and slides uh, and graphs because I'm an academic, so I, I can't help myself. And you called it Tree University, so I figured there should be some data in it. Um, but hopefully plenty of pictures as well and lots of opportunity for, for questions. Um, so just before I start properly, I really want to acknowledge all those people who have helped and supported this, this work over the years. Um, we've had funding from a, a load of great organizations that are, are shown here, but also um, a lot of stakeholders, people interested in pawpaw or who use or market pawpaw or pawpaw products, including Jackie O's Beer, Integration Acres, San Filippo, Riverside Native Trees, and the Ohio Fruit Growers Marketing Association. A um, whole bunch of other people listed there as well that have helped out with, with field work over the last four or five years that have been working on Port Um I would also uh, like to, uh, to dedicate this particular talk uh, to Terry Powell, the, the late wife of uh, Dr. Ron Powell, who leads Ohio Port Port Growers Association. Uh, Terry very sadly passed away this summer. She was a real leading light in uh, establishing the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association and the North American Pawpaw Growers Association. And um, we've worked a lot on the Powell's Farm, uh, Foxpaw Ridge, and they've been huge supporters of our, of our work. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? Well, first of all, I want to say that most of, the, of any work I present here is actually uh, probably collected by, by Sarah, our graduate student who did a, a master's thesis with Joe and I and finished that um, year before last and has now gone on to complete a, a PhD, uh, well, sorry, to, to work on a PhD. Um, so everything you see here is really a result of, of her hard work. So I'll give you all a, a brief introduction to Pawpaw, um, talk a little bit about things that control fruiting success and, and yield in Pawpaw, because what we all really want is the fruit. Um, and I can share with you some of our uh, lessons that we've learned about managing wild pawpaw patches and establishing um, establishing trees, as well as a little bit about that fruit quality and, and how that, that varies. A lot of this is, is work in progress from ongoing projects. You know, we, we started pretty small scale with this work and uh, only now we, we're really beginning to get good data out of some of those, those larger grants that we've, we've got. Uh, so just to very very uh, briefly introduce Pawpaw, I, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. Um, so this is this is the Pawpaw tree, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, its scientific name is Asim Asimina triloba. It's a member of the Ananaceae family, the, the custard apple family, and most other members of that group are uh, tropical plants, tropical trees. Um, so there are a, a number of relatives of Pawpaw. Um, um, other members of, of the Asimina genus that grow further south in the United States and down into Mexico, including the, the soursop and the uh, uh, cherimoya, which people might be familiar with. And so pawpaw is really interesting as this outlier species with a distribution that goes all the way from, from Florida up into uh, southern Canada um, and, and as far west as the Mississippi River. Um, in the woods, uh, pawpaw is an understory tree. So it grows beneath the canopy in the shady understory conditions. Um, and it, grow, it tends to grow in patches. So you can see that here, this kind of dense thicket-like patch of, of pawpaw trees with these clusters of, uh, of fruit on them, which maybe you can see on the previous slide as well. So each individual flower produces uh, a cluster of, of one to, well, sometimes upwards of uh, five or six fruit. Um, the fruit itself um, is, is pretty unique. So I've got a couple here. They, they really range in size. I don't know if people can see that on, on the camera here. 
trying to get it in focus. Okay, so that's that's one. This is one that came off uh, the tree in our yard that we planted a, a couple of years ago. Um, and you know everything from from that to that. This is one of the um, kind of new newer varietals that's been released. Um, whereas this is off a, a wild tree that I, I collected today. So they really do range in size anywhere from you know this is uh, over a pound in weight, like almost one and a quarter pound, and this is like the size of a of a golf ball. So that the quality and size of them uh, varies hugely. But when you you cut them open. You get this amazing aroma, this kind of tropical fruit aroma, and you see this beautiful um, orange yellow flesh and those that row of uh, brown brown seeds in there. And if you've never eaten them, I, I really do recommend uh, tasting them as, as soon as you can. They're in season right now, so uh, get out collecting. Um, the flavor is described as a mixture of kind of banana and mango and, and pineapple. Uh, they make great ice cream, great smoothies. They can be used in baking. And there's actually a, a new Paw Paw recipe book that's, uh, that's just come out, which would be worth uh, looking into if you're uh, interested in that. Um, there's a lot of interesting kind of Paw Paw value-added products, as we call them in the biz, I suppose. Um, one of the most well-known is uh, the Paw Paw Wheat Ale, uh, made by uh, Jackie O's Brewery from Athens, Ohio. Uh, Paw Paw, you can buy Paw Paw Frozen Pulp, on, online from Integration Acres, there's a, a packet of it there. Um, and if you want to find the fresh fruit at, the, at present, you're really probably limited to places like uh, farmers markets or, or direct from growers. There are some growers who sell online. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, there's a wildly enthusiastic poor poor community, uh, but it's surprising just how many people you meet, given that it's Ohio's state native fruit and a native fruit to, uh, Eastern North America, just, just how many people haven't tried them. Everybody knows about pawpaw, but, but few people have tried them. Um, so it's, uh, it's one of those things at the moment that the really access to it is limited by supply rather than, than demand. And so we're trying to help growers and producers catch up with that, uh, that demand for both pawpaw and derived products. One of the big issues that we have for our growers uh, and as I mentioned earlier, what got us into working on pawpaw originally is um, issues to do with yield. So as I mentioned, pawpaw is a, an understory tree. It grows, uh, grows in the forest, understory, uh, in these kind of darker, shadier conditions. Um, and when you're trying to produce a, a fruit that's nearly, not quite as big as my head, but nearly as big as my head, obviously that's, that's a huge um, demand on energy and the you know, trees, derive their energy by the, by the production of carbohydrates through, through photosynthesis, which requires light. So if you're limited for light, you have a limited energy resource to, to draw on. And that maybe we, we thought initially was one of the key factors uh, controlling yield in these, in these woodlands. So we've been addressing that in um, some of our, kind of one side of the work we do that's focused on woodland production at a, a bunch of different sites across Ohio, shown here on the map, uh, including two right here in Columbus uh, at the OSU Wetlands Research Park on the banks of the Olentangy River, and also at Waterman Farm, uh, the Ag College is here uh, at Research Farm in Columbus. We also have uh, wild stands at OSU Piketon, the South Center's facility down in Southern Ohio, at uh, Integration Acres outside Athens and at Foxpaw Farm right down there on the, uh, the edge of uh, Ohio by the Ohio River near, near Aberdeen. Um, and we've been monitoring trends in productivity in these forests um, for a number of years now. We've just beginning to get the data in for, for 2021. And what's interesting is we see a lot of variability both uh, between years and between sites. So this figure here is showing for the uh, five different sites we've been monitoring for some amount of time, the average number of fruit that we're getting from that tree. You can immediately see that one of our sites, Integration Acres here in blue, is a really big outlier in terms of production, at least in, in some years. And we can talk about why that is in, in a minute here. Um, the others, uh, it's kind of hard to see what's going on with them. So if I remove uh, the amazing productive integration acre site for a minute. Uh, you can see what's going on with the others. Um, again, you can see we've got even here, we've got one site, Foxpaw Farm, um, 
which seems to be a bit different to all the others. It's a bit more managed. Um, again, we can talk about what they've been doing there in a second. But what you see with the other kind of more wild stands, unmanaged wild stands, is they're showing this really strong fluctuation from, from year to year in production where we have you know, a bumpy year and it tends to be followed by a, a dip year afterwards. And um, that's something that we're really interested in because we know some fruit trees, when they're resource limited, um, will go into what's called biennial bearing. So apples are, are famous for doing that when they're a bit stressed. And so you'll get some apples every year, but it's kind of every other year you get a really good year of flowering and a really bumper crop of apples. So we're beginning to wonder whether pawpaw actually exhibits a, a similar behavior, which might be an adaptation to um, uh, you know, lack of energetic resources in the, in the forest understory. So what's going on with, you know, thinking about that, it's interesting to think about why integration acres is so productive and why Foxpaw Farm seems to have this uh, high, you know, higher on average and more stable yield over time. Well, we think the big answer is to do with, with light availability. I know this graph is probably a little bit complicated, but what we're showing here is a whole bunch of, of monitoring we've done to evaluate how the probability of producing any fruit, so even just one fruit, because many of our trees in the, in the forest don't produce any fruit at all. We were interested in how the probability of getting any fruit in these woodland stands changes as a function of the, the size of the tree and whether or not the, the forest canopy is, is open or closed. And so all the blue dots here are closed canopy uh, plots, closed canopy patches. They've got a big forest canopy above them. All of the red dots are uh, patches where there was at least 50% canopy openness. So there was much more light availability. Um, so what we find is that, you know, the, I guess if you're gonna take it on average, the sort of, you get this curve relationship where very small trees don't have a great probability of producing fruit that increases pretty rapidly as the trees get older such that by the time you get a tree of about um, 10 centimeters, so about roughly uh, five inches, um, you've got a pretty good probability of, of getting at, at least one fruit. Um, so if you've got a three inch diameter tree, you've got about an 80% probability of, of getting a fruit on average, There's variation between, between sites. Um, but if we look at what happens on average in these open canopy conditions, well, the tree only needs to be half as big to have the same probability of at least producing one fruit. So trees are producing fruit when they're smaller, when they're younger, probably as a result of, of greater uh, resources uh, available to them. So light seems to be really important and tree size seems to be really important. Both of those things uh, control the probability of you, you getting a fruit off your tree. When we look at the actual relationship with the number of fruit that trees produce, we see really different relationships again between tree size. So this is again looking at tree size along the bottom, so the diameter of the tree versus the predicted number of fruit that we get off it. And again in red here we've got the open canopy patches, sorry the closed canopy patches, and in blue we've got the, uh, the open canopy patches, it's the other way around just to be confusing. So you, again you can see how um, as trees get bigger, you do get more fruit in the closed canopy conditions, but not by very much. So, you, you know, by the time you've got these, these larger trees of about 16 centimeters in diameter, um, so about eight inches, you might be getting up to about, uh, you know, just under 20 fruit. But look how in those open canopy conditions, the production really takes off as those trees mature. So that once you're getting to trees that are, um, you know, get in that six to eight, uh, inch diameter range, you could be getting uh, hundreds of fruits off of those trees. So light availability seems to be one of the critical controlling factors for pawpaw production in the in the forest understory. Uh, so again, tree size is going to increase yield and canopy openness is going to increase yield. Those are some other things that are uh, important too though, and pawpaw flowers were, were mentioned in the introduction there. So this is a pawpaw flower. Uh, they flower really early in the year uh, before they leaf up. They're one of the first things that you'll, you'll start to see flowering kind of tree-wise. Um, the flowers are a little bit inconspicuous, but once you kind of get your eye in, you can really see them. They have these 
fleshy maroon red petals and these kind of uh, yellowish green um, reproductive structures in, in the inside. Um, you can see that the leaves here are kind of that bright yet yellowish green because they've only just the buds have only just uh, broken. So this is probably a relatively late flower. Many of the flowers come out before the, the uh, leaf buds have broken at all. Um, they are part. They have you know the appearance of the flower and its odor. It has this musky scent to it. Um, is believed to be an adaptation to kind of mimic uh, carrion. Right? So uh, dead, dead meat matter, I suppose, um, dead animals. And they're pollinated, but not by our normal pollinating insects that we would tend to think of. So uh, things like uh, bees and butterflies, but rather by, by flies and beetles, uh, which aren't particularly efficient pollinators. Um, so um, that's one thing that we think might be uh, important is you know pollination limitation, a limited number of pollinators, but also another interesting characteristic of these trees which relates to that patch structure I showed earlier, in that many of these pawpaw patches are actually clonal. What that, I mean by that is that an individual parent tree produces lots of uh, root suckers, and those come up as, you know, uh, I guess they're sibling trees, aren't they really, or clonal trees around, around the, the parent tree. And that's a great adaptation if you're growing in shady conditions and you want to reproduce, um, because instead of you know, taking the risk gambling of producing these, these huge fruit, which is a big energy investment and the risk of uh, seed um, uh, being viable and finding a germination site, rather in those, again, which is challenging in those shady conditions, rather the tree can, can draw on the resources of the parent tree and uh, produce those, those root suckers. But the trees also show what's called self unfruitfulness. So Clonal trees with the same genetic identity don't appear to be very good at pollinating one another. So we've got two other things going on here. One is inefficient pollinators and a lack of, uh, a lack of pollinators in the forest understory. And the second is that these clonal patches and many patches have been demonstrated to be entirely one single clone. Many of these patches may not be able to pollinate the, the individual trees uh, in the patch. Uh, so we've done some work on this. This is Libby, the student that uh, started it all with me, and she's here running a little uh, pilot uh, pollination uh, experiment where we were looking at pollen transfer between different trees and how that affected uh, fruit set. So she took trees, uh, took pollen from various different flowers, enclosed the flowers have been enclosed in these pollination bags to exclude pollinators, and then we hand pollinated them uh, with pollen from different sources. Uh, and you can see here, here we've removed one of the bags and you can see this young cluster of, of fruit developing. Um, it's really handy having these bags on because it means that we can actually still take the bags off. So even if the fruit don't mature, and many times pawpaw trees in the forest, they'll look like they're pollinated and they look like they're trying to produce tiny little baby fruit, but then those fruit will abort. Uh, so that, that those high rates of self-abortion, again, are thought to be a reflection of, of limited resources to in, invest in those developing fruit. But we were able to determine by collecting the kind of drop flowers within the bags whether or not they'd actually been successfully pollinated. Some of them, the fruit grew so rapidly, they actually burst out of our bags, as you can see here. Um, so what we did is we pollinated trees with pollen that was either taken from a different tree in the same patch, um, a different plot, so a different patch, but at the same site, or trees from an entirely different site. Uh, so we kind of got like a, we should have like a gradient of genetic dissimilarity here where, you know, if the patches are clonal, all of these trees in the same patch should be, uh, have identical genes. And these ones from a different site should be, uh, should be entirely genetically different. And here we looked just at the number of fruit that were produced uh, in this little uh, experiment. So what we found, it wasn't entirely clear, but um, we did seem to consistently get a higher average number of fruit when we use pollen from a different site. And this is an experiment we're planning to, to scale up um, in the future. Um, it is worth pointing out that a lot of growers will hand pollinate their trees uh, to cross pollinate between different varieties just to ensure they're getting a good, good fruit set. So if you only have one or two trees and you're growing them in your yard, hand pollination is a, is a really good idea 
Um, so I have three trees in my yard, for example, only one of them really flowered this year because they're still pretty young. That's the one I got this fruit off. Um, so I actually went out into the woods and collected some pollen off other trees and, and hand pollinated the tree in, in my yard. And I think that's why I was able to get some, some fruit this year because there's no other pawpaw trees around in my, uh, my neighborhood. Okay, so knowing all of this, we've been starting to do some experimentation around managing these wild patches to try and improve their, uh, their productivity. And it's early days yet, but I can share a little bit of what we've been doing. Um, most of that has revolved around trying to increase light availability and reduce competition in the forest understory. Um, so we've been doing this site both at OSU properties and with some of our collaborating growers. So for example, this is one of our pawpaw plots at Integration Acres. And you can see this understory um, you can't even really see that there's pawpaw trees here, maybe like a leaf here, but it's heavily dominated by, by spice bush. There were some invasives in there like honeysuckle as well, a pretty dense um, canopy over the top. Um, so Sarah and I went in there and really cleared out the understory. So yes, we're cutting down native species like spice bush, but um, actually in this case, the grower we were working with also produces spice bush tea. So we were, yep, we were cutting it to the ground, but uh, that all spice bush re-sprouts vigorously. So it'll be back and just as big in a couple of years time. Uh, so, you know, there's an interesting opportunity for multi-cropping there in forest settings. Um, you can see we have got a backpack spray there because where we did find invasives, we were uh, putting a little bit of glyphosate on to make sure they didn't come back. But you can see we've really opened up the understory and here's Sarah with all the, we, we took down a couple of larger trees just to increase light availability. And you can now actually see the, the pawpaw trees in amongst there. So re that reduced competition should increase the resources available for pawpaws. Um, this is the first year that, that following the treatment that we've been able to track these patches. Um, so we're just now getting the data on how much fruit they've actually produced. Um, we, in some areas, have also um, taken down some trees. So this was us uh, in a big pawpaw patch on Foxpaw Farm, threading the needle there with a, a maple tree to reduce um, competition, and increase light availability for these pawpaws in the understory. Maples produce a, a really dense shade. So we took out a couple of trees just to open things up a little bit and we'll be tracking the effects of that. Um, Sarah in her initial visits has found some interesting results. Um, one thing uh, people, I've been debating for years is that, that whether or not pawpaw are, are sensitive to UV light. That can be an issue when you're establishing uh, young trees yourself. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether that's uh, the, the sort of yellowing and, and crunching up of the leaves is a symptom of, of uh, damage from UV or whether it's um, just moisture stress. I, I can talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but what's been interesting is on some of these sites, we have actually seen signs of, um, of UV damage to the trees where they've um, been, uh, it, where light availability has been increased. So there might be a short-term trade-off uh, for tree health in, in some situations where they've been really heavily shaded previously. So we're, we're tracking that too. Um, other things we've been doing is looking at introducing genetic uh, variability into these clonal patches. So we've been grafting in um, various different uh, uh, cultivar trees as well as uh, wild trees from other patches. So here's one of Sarah's grafts you can see that's successfully taken. It's pretty hard to get grafts to take uh, within a forest setting, but we, we have managed to, to do that successfully. And so we've grafted in some of these varietals because we know that they're highly productive. Um, there's a lot of genetic variability in terms of the productivity and the quality of fruit from wild trees. So by putting varietal trees in there of known productivity of known fruit quality and size, we can evaluate whether, you know, having them growing in those shadier woodland conditions is, is a, affecting their, their production. So again, we'll be tracking this um, over time here. Uh, but planting in varietals, ready grafted trees that you can buy from plant nurseries uh, is another option too. Um, so we'll be, and we'll be working on that in a, a new grant we've just got um, over the next uh, three or four years here. So we're going to be doing some outplanting experiments of different types of tree uh, in a variety of different uh, woodland settings to both diversify the genetics of existing patches and to try and <coughs> establish whole new patches in woodlands where there aren't currently pawpaw. <coughs> so if we talk a little bit about tree establishment, 
because um, obviously many people are interested in establishing pawpaws themselves in their yards or even maybe starting a small pawpaw orchard. Um, that's another piece of the work that we've been doing at uh, two orchards, two research orchards at uh, Waterman Farm here in Columbus and the OSU Piketon facility. And these are actually some of the biggest single plantings of, of pawpaw now um, in the state of Ohio. Um, uh, we've got about a dozen different varietals at present, um, plus a whole bunch of seedling trees, which we've just grafted on a bunch more varietals to uh, this, this year. So we, we're going to be getting upwards of, of two dozen varieties in these orchards that are replicated in these different conditions at, at Piked and, and Waterman. Uh, we've been doing some interesting stuff there, uh, looking at how we can improve um, establishment success. So when we created these orchards, we did it under two different um, management regimes. This is uh, what you're seeing here is our orchard that planted out in these rows. Uh, here, we're actually growing them on uh, mounded um, soil. So we mounded it up a little bit, uh, covered it in landscape fabric here to suppress weeds. And uh, we're actually running drip irrigation underneath landscape fabric. Um, and that will also provide us with the opportunity to do fertigation, to start fertilizing the trees uh, in the future and look at whether soil fertility also um, controls fruit set. Um, so we've got irrigation here, we've got uh, weed control. Uh, you can also see that we've got these little cages on some of the trees. So these are little uh, wire cages onto which we've put um, shade netting. Again, to look at that uh, effect of, of UV light damage as potentially controlling tree establishment. Um, so these this side of the orchard, everything's really babied and looked after really well. They've got everything they could possibly need. No competition, shade, potentially, water, nutrients, great growing conditions. The other side, you can maybe just see over there, that's our low input where, where really we just planted them and then walked away. And we uh, com have been comparing their, uh, their survival and their growth uh, thereafter. So what have we found out? Um, so these are some results from the two different orchards here uh, in kind of brownish colors at uh, the Piketon Orchard, which is a little bit further south. And here in blue, our Columbus Orchard. At the moment, we've got data of survival rates for two different years, for 2019 and 2020, for each of the sites. We've got our high input system, uh, the top two rows here, and our low input system, the bottom two rows. And we were compared in the orchard uh, trees that were purchased from uh, tree nurseries. So these were ready grafted varietals. Uh, they came to us depending on the supply, either in, in pots, so with like soil around the roots with a nice root ball, or uh, as bare root plants, uh, but grafted. And then we have these seedling trees, which we um, just purchased from a, a forestry restoration native plant nursery. So these are ungrafted uh, wild trees no control over genetic provenance, but they haven't been grafted. And so grafting is, we believe is gonna introduce some stress because it involves cutting the top of the tree off and grafting on a new variety and all those cambium and those moisture um, transporting uh, vessels have got to reconnect themselves. So generally what we found was that uh, we saw higher survival rates of the seedling trees most of the time, not always here in Piketon in, in 2020, the grafted trees showed a little bit higher survival rate, but by and large, across most of the conditions, seedling trees, so without grafts, um, that, that stress of the graft showed um, higher survival rates. Um, we've now, as I said, mentioned earlier, we've now grafted onto those trees, now they're established, um, and we'll be tracking the survival of those grafts as, as well. Um, we also tended to find, uh, if you just look at, eyeball the numbers that, um, on average, across the two different types of, of material we planted, that our high input uh, tended to have um, greater survival rates than, uh, than the low input. Um, so you kind of see that here, I simplified it a little bit averaged across the site. So you can see that the high input tends to have uh, higher survival rates than the low input. So for seedling trees, for those bare root grafted trees and for those container grown trees. Um, and the seedlings had the highest survival rates uh, overall, although not that different from the container grown trees uh, in the low input system. So 
bare root stock. So plants that are arriving you, you know, shipped in cardboard boxes with no soil around their roots seem to experience a, a bit more shock when they're transplanted. Uh, and also, uh, you know, moisture stress for those newly established trees seems to influence um, survival rates as well. So we recommend if you're establishing varietals, planting um, container grown stock and uh, or, or seedling trees and then grafting yourself if you feel confident doing that. And um, we have some instructional videos on, online and we sometimes run grafting workshops as well if you're interested in learning how to do that. Um, so container grown stock or, or seedling trees uh, and watering well in the first couple of years seems to be important. We've also been tracking growth subsequently. So over here, again, this is a more complicated figure, I, I realize, but all these boxes over here represent our high input treatments. These are our low input treatments. Uh, again, within each of these, we've got the bare root uh, varietals, the container grown varietals, and the seedling trees. Uh, and so this boxes just show the kind of amount of variation in, in relative growth rates. Um, so you can see some trees did shrink. That's because they, they died back and re-sprouted again from the bottom uh, when they established stress and they died. But within the high input, you can see that again, that um, we tend to see higher growth rates in the high input than in the low input on average and a little bit higher growth rates for the container grown stock and the seeding trees compared to those bare root varietals where they're dealing with the stress, stress of both being grafted and of being uh, transplanted with, with bare roots. Uh, we've been digging into this a little bit more over the, the last summer doing some work on, on plant physiology. So uh, this is Sarah, uh, the graduate student again, who's, who's our purple expert. She's looking at uh, uh, leaf uh, water pressure, leaf turga, so to uh, evaluate drought stress. And uh, this is uh, Rachel Glover, another student in our in our lab who's me measuring uh, using a technique called chlorophyll fluorescence, which allows us to evaluate the, the abundance of chlorophyll in the leaves. So it's a kind of quantitative measure of you know how yellow or, or green the, the leaves are essentially, a, a nice indicator of plant health. Uh, again, early days for this data, but um, we, the other measurement we make is something called stomatal conductance, where, um, where we measure the amount of moisture coming out of the leaf stomata. So for, I'm sure many of you know that leaf stomata are those little openings that tree that all plants have on their leaves that allow carbon dioxide to go in and oxygen to, to come out um, as well as, but when they're open, it also allows moisture to escape. So plants will close off their stomata to reduce moisture loss when they're drought stressed. So this measure of stomatal conductance is essentially a measure of how much moisture is coming out. The more moisture that's coming out, the less drought stressed the trees are. And what we see here, again, with loads, across loads and loads of measurements is, these are the averages here in these, these big circles, is that we tend to see, I mean, it's very variable between trees, um, between varieties, this is, and this again, this is averaged across those, those different types of material we planted. But by and large, you can see that the stomatal conductance is, tends to be higher on average in the high input system than the low input system, suggesting that some of what we're seeing in the survival and growth differences of these trees is, to do, is due to moisture stress. So again, emphasizing the importance of, of watering and, and uh, making sure you've got nice moist soil for these trees to grow in. So again, yeah, drought stress is increasing down the way just for uh, clarity. And we've got that reduction on average in stomatal conductance when we go from the high to the low input system. Okay, so that's a little bit on establishing trees. Lots of things to think about. Uh, if you're gonna grow purple yourself, make sure you water them in really well, especially for the first couple of years. If you're growing them from, um, uh, wild trees, then you might want to think about using shade. Um, we've also been looking a little bit at variation in fruitability. And one of the questions we get is like, why do we bother with these uh, commercial cultivars? Uh, and the big reason is we get better quality fruit off of them. So this again is just looking at the relationship between the size of the fruit um, and their, their mass, their, their weight. And you can see that all these wild collective fruit tend to be clustered 
down here at these relatively low sizes and weights, whereas for the cultivars, and the cultivars vary, hu vary hugely, but again, on average, most of the fruit are, are kind of heading up here into the sort of quarter, at least a quarter of a pound sort of weight size. Um, so we get bigger fruits when we're using these selected uh, cultivars. Um, but they vary hugely. This is just a little chart from some of the results we've got across a whole bunch of different sites. Um, uh, and looking at, uh, we did some modeling to see whether if you were going to be selling these, these fruit, you could actually turn a profit based on the, the yield. Um, you know, so there's a number of varieties which are yielding very large numbers of fruit uh, or particularly large fruit on average. So here, this variety Potamac is producing on average fruit that are half a pound in weight, which is yielding you um, almost half a pound of pulp. But you can see some of these trees really not producing very many fruit at all. That doesn't mean that they're good trees. In fact, Quaker's Delight here is one of my favorite varietals. Um, Susquehanna is another great variety too in terms of quality. But um, so what this means here, this kind of color coded is depending on how you're marketing your fruit, you're going to get a different price for it. So you might get um, one or two dollars a pound if you're selling it wholesale to a processor, you might get eight to twelve dollars at a farmer's market and, and maybe even a little bit more for processed pulp. But there's, you know, there's only a few varieties where uh, it's shown in blue here, you're actually turning a, turning a profit if you're growing a reasonable sized orchard. But as I say, some of these varieties are great too. Quaker's Delight and Sus Susquehanna, uh, both really high quality in other aspects. And so people often ask us like, what's the, the best pork or to grow? And, and really it uh, depends what you're looking for. Um, there's a whole variety of things that we've been evaluating on these fruits, including um, a disease called uh, Phyllosticta, which is a blackening of the skin of the fruit. It's a fungal disease. It can cause cracking of the skin or result in reduced quality. So there's a number of varieties here, especially like Wells, Sunflower and Potamac, which seem to be pretty resistant to Phyllosticta. Susca, Hannah, on the other hand, although it produces really nice big fruit with limited number of seeds, as you can see here, least number of seeds we're getting for Susca, Hannah, which is kind of in, in like rank order of quality. The stuff in red is like a, a watch out so um, you know, Susquehanna, really susceptible to phyllosticta, but producing very few seeds, which means it's easier to process and you get a lot more pulp uh, per pound of, of harvested fruit. Um, flavor, again, Overlease, Rappahannock uh, uh, tend to be very, very popular. Uh, the firmness of the fruit is important if you're wanting to market it. Uh, one of the issues with pawpaw is they bruise very easily and they're very thin skin, so it's easy to damage them. So there's a number of varieties here, especially sunflower, which are a lot firmer, easier to transport. And if you're looking to use them for, for baking or maybe for brewing, so people make pawpaw beer, but also pawpaw wine, uh, sugar content varies a lot as well. So the varieties Susquehanna and NC1 have pretty high sugar contents, whereas uh, Shawnee Trail and Shenandoah have, um, have rather lower sugar contents. So the best variety really depends upon what you want to do, what your flavor preferences are, the flavors and colors of the flesh of these things vary wildly. And so it depends on what your intended product is and uh, what your personal preferences are too. So get out there and taste a lot of pawpaws before you decide what to plant. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some emerging pests and disease problems. Fire stick is an issue. Interestingly, more of an issue in orchards when these are grown as, as monocultures. So we're looking at some organic and non-organic methods to control um, fungal diseases. There's a lot of uh, basic good practices you can do, like gathering up leaves underneath your trees in the fall to reduce uh, the abundance of, of phyllosticta, removing any diseased leaves or any diseased fruit and discarding them. Uh, but there are some sprays that, uh, that we're, they're not currently certified for use on pawpaw. So we're doing some trials for that as well. And there's some pests too. So the pawpaw peduncle borer, it can be an issue. It's a little, uh, uh, it's a moth, lays eggs on the pawpaw tree and they will infest just about every part of the pawpaw tree from the peduncle of the fruit, which is where they were originally found. So the peduncle is like the little stem that connects the, the flower or the fruit to the tree. They were originally thought just to live in there, but we found them in the wood in the peduncle, in the stem, and in the fruit themselves as well. So you need to, to watch out for that. 
Um, we're doing some experiments at present to try and improve quality. Some, uh, so here's Sarah, she's doing a hand thinning experiment. So many trees produce these big clusters of fruit. And what that results in is, is lots of fruit, but they all tend to be really small and that makes them hard to process and also limits their value. So Sarah's here this year started doing an experiment where she's thinning out the number of individual fruits in each cluster, looking at that trade off between if you reduce the total number of fruit, how does their size and their quality increase as a result? Uh, we're also doing some experiments uh, on pawpaw processing because there's no easy way to do that at present. Uh, both the seeds and the skin can cause digestive issues if they're consumed, so they really need to be processed well for pulp. This is Sarah doing a trial using a tool called a RoboCoop, which is a commercial juicing machine. Seems to be working pretty well. Uh, and we're also doing, we mentioned bruising earlier, we're also doing some trials with netting underneath trees um, to try and reduce uh, bruising when they fall, because uh, Pawpaw are really annoying in their ripening habits. The fruit don't ripen you know, sequentially. They don't ripen uh, synchronously all at one time, kind of like apples do. They ripen sequentially. They have a long flowering period. Uh, and so the, the fruit on an individual tree will ripen at all different times. And it's very difficult to tell when a pawpaw is ripe. They don't change color quite in the same way like an apple would. Um, and if you pick them too early when they're too hard, they actually won't ever ripen properly. Um, so most producers in the past to pick the fruit off the ground when they've dropped, but current USDA regulations don't allow you to market dropped fruit. So these netting systems are a solution to both of those problems of, of bruising and of wanting to only pick the fruit when they're actually properly ripe. So uh, just to sum it all up, I haven't, hope I haven't spoken for too long. Um, our results are showing that fruit production in wild stands is really variable between sites and between years. There's no kind of one recipe that I can tell you that's gonna necessarily improve production in your stands if you, if you do have a patch. Um, but uh, we think light availability is, is, abs is really key, but there are still important genetic controls. So some patches are gonna be clonal and sometimes those, those varieties, those, those genetic strains are, are just not very productive. Um, so you can consider hand pollinating if you are seeing limited uh, pollination um, success, limited fruit set, but also grafting in and supplemental uh, planting of, of varietals, which are going to provide you with uh, greater productivity, genetic variability uh, within your stands and your, your patches. Um, orchards, if you ha do have a bit of space to, to plant trees, are a, a really good economic alternative where space is available. And we're seeing a lot of orchards going in in Ohio now, um, tens of acres have gone in just in the last couple of years alone. Um, so um, if you are establishing orchards or even if you're just planting them in your yard, we do recommend um, washing the trees using a, a high input system. So controlling weeds underneath the trees and so mulching underneath the trees is a good alternative to, to landscape fabrics to suppress weeds. Um, uh, making sure they're well watered to reduce stress, increase survival, maybe using shade cloth that seems to be a particular issue if you're using uh, wild trees from seed. So those, um, those uh, trees grown on from seed collected from, from wild, um, uh, wild parent plants, that the parent plants are habituated to, to shady conditions. And the, there seems to be a parental effect then when those, those seedling trees experience, seem to experience greater UV damage um, and, and moisture stress when they're outplanted in, in full sun than the varietals do, interestingly. So we haven't had any issues with uh, UV damage to the varieties that we've planted out in the, in the orchards. It's all been from those seedling trees. So irrigate, use shade cloth, and we recommend using container grown stock or grafting in situ to maximize your, uh, your survival. Uh, and then finally, it's important to choose the right varieties to obtain your desired quality or, or, and or economic outcome. And yeah, they really do vary wildly in flavor. If you are just growing wild trees, and there are a number of nurseries now, including here in Columbus, you know, they're selling pawpaw trees. Um, don't overpay for something that's an ungrafted variety. You know, grafted varieties are gonna cost you now for a, a, a decent tree, somewhere in the region of, of 25 to, to $45. There are some plant nurseries that are selling 
pawpaw trees and they're just wild seedling trees for thirty dollars. You don't want to be paying that much for uh, for a seedling tree. You can grow them yourself from seed very easily, and I'm happy to to talk about how you can how you can do that if, if folk are interested. Um, yeah, and I will leave it there. And if there's any questions, very happy to to take them. So Matt, we do have a few questions here and we'll okay. spend uh, the next uh, five or 10 minutes. When were pawpaws right for picking this year? I never found any fruit as many times as I checked. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't know where you've been checking, but you know, as, as we talked about here, the availability, I don't know whether you didn't find any fruit at all or you didn't find any ripe fruit. So um, the, it depends a little bit the growing conditions they're in. Uh, so the trees in the woodlands um, in and around Columbus, they're dropping their fruit right now. Um, so that the fruit are ripe right now. If you go a bit further south, down to kind of like Athens area, down to like, you know, the Southern Ohio, uh, they, that's already, they're already been and gone. Um, if you're a little bit further north, um, it's maybe another week or two till the, until you're getting that ripeness. But we, as I mentioned, they have this sequential ripening. So when I go out to our patches we have in here in Columbus, there's fruit on the ground, but there's also still like rock hard fruit on the, on the same tree. Um, so right now is a good time to get out foraging if you want to try and find some, some pawpaw. Okay. And follow sticta infected fruit still be used for pulp? Yes. Yep, even if the skin is cracked, obviously you want to check that when you're processing it. Um, there's, there's no issue normally with the fruit inside. Um, sometimes you just you want to check that there's, there's no rot or no pests that have got in there. But yep, you can still, you know, they're going to be a problem for, for marketing fresh, but yes, you can still use the pulp. Okay, great. I have seen at least one nursery offering root trimmed two-year-old plants. How does root trimming affect survival and growth? That's a good uh, good question. We haven't done any work on that. Um, so root trimming is something that some people do. Uh, so pawpaw, when it grows, um, it produce, it's got really weird roots, these strange, white, fleshy roots, and it really doesn't produce much fine, fine root uh, mass. So, you know, when you take a normal plant, normal tree, you'll find all those, those fine roots, which are really important for a accessing moisture and nutrients. Pawpaw really doesn't have that in the same way. It has these kind of thick, fleshy roots and it produces a big, deep tap root um, early on. So again, if you're looking to germinate pawpaw from, from seed, and I'm very happy to answer any questions on that. Don't panic if you don't see them, like when you think you should be, because they, they start off growing this big, deep tap root and they put a lot of energy into that and not so much into like the the side roots, which are important for accessing moisture and nutrients. So some, yeah, some nurseries have been uh, either air pruning the trees by growing them on, uh, you know, on a rack. So the, the tap root hits the bottom of the pot and dies when it comes out into the air and it starts producing a lot of, of side roots that way, or indeed root pruning. I have not done any trials with, with root pruned trees. So I can't comment on how it uh, affects their, their survival, but um, a lot of growers seem, seem keen on doing that. Okay. Uh, can pawpaws be successfully air grafted, understanding the lack of a tap root from this process? So I'm not sure when you, when you say air grafted, I, I, I guess you're meaning um, kind of air, air root pruned. Um, yes, people, people do that. We've, we've done it and they'll produce, uh, they'll, they'll start producing side roots as well. Okay. How long can pawpaws be container grown before requiring transplantation into the ground? Oh dear, I'll try not to answer that. Uh, there's too much of a smart ask question answer. I mean, the, the, the answer is, depends on the size of the container. Um, so when we grow our seedlings, we grow them in uh, like these uh, 16 inch, uh, they're called uh, tree tubes. They're the kind of square plastic tubes. So they're, they're like big, deep pots, but relatively narrow. Uh, we grow them on for either a year or two, uh, often in the greenhouse for the first year, and then kind of harden them off uh, in the in the second year. And uh, they seem to do seem to do fine. Um, people, you know, we've also had pawpaw seedlings that people have given to us that they've just grown in a, in a normal plant pot. But they they do really want to produce that that tap root. 
And what you don't want to get is a situation where that tap root starts going round and round and round in the, in the bottom of the pot. Because um, as I say, they do experience a lot of shock, transplant shock. They do want to have that nice deep tap root. So, you know, if you have got them in a small plot, a small pot, they'll probably be all right for a year, but not, not much more than that. And um, one lesson that we learned pretty early is if you do have them in a, well, in any kind of pot, do keep them up off the ground. Um, one of the main causes we have more of, of mortality when we produce our first batch of, of pawpaw um, was they, they'd all put their um, roots out of their bottom of their pots, their tap root out the bottom of the pot, through the landscape fabric underneath them, down into the ground. And so that those roots then got damaged when we came to move the pots and, and most of those trees died. So yeah, keep them mm -hmm. above ground. Okay, here's a good question for you. Why did you choose the pawpaw specifically instead of another native tree? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. So uh, it's not that, not that I don't like other native trees. Um, I mean, it's just an incredible fruit. It's so weird to have this like large tropical fruit growing in the understories of our forest. There's, there's nothing like that. I mean, it's truly unique in terms of its ecology. It's like weird pollination behavior. It's weird clonality. Um, it's a, a beautiful tree, just as a ornamental landscape plant. And yeah, the fruit are, are incredible. So um, I, I just got I just got hooked. Um, okay. You know, I, right. I like persimmons and walnuts and hazelnuts too. So happy to grow them. So my question to follow up is: Do you like the taste of pawpaws? Yes, very much. I know not everybody does, but uh, yeah. I think they're, they're delicious, yeah. And can you tell a difference in taste in the cultivars? <laughs> I'm not sure I'd do very well at a blind tasting, but uh, people who know what they uh, are talking about can. Yeah, there's, there's differences in, in color and, and flavor. Um, but what's interesting is the, the flavor also changes um, pretty dramatically as the fruit ripens. So, you know, this, mm -hmm. they're different sizes. This one was off a tree just today. It's kind of like, well, I, you know, kind of the, the firmness you'd want a peach to be when you um, get it in the supermarket. So it's got a little bit of give to it, um, but you can see it's kind of bright green still. Um, a little bit of phyla stick to on it, you can see there. Um, this one was off the tree in my yard and we've let it ripen a little bit more. You can see it's more of a sort of bright apple green with a kind of hint of, of yellow to it. So that's been off the tree ripening a little bit more. Um, and as the float, as they ripen, um, the flavor profile changes. So you're going to get those kind of fruity, mango-y, pineapple-y flavors earlier on. And then the, as they ripen, you get these kind of caramel flavors coming through. Mm. Some, some people like them really almost brown. And then they have a really strong caramel flavor, which can be really great in baking, actually. But um, mm. they're not, not so pretty to look at by that point. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I love pawpaw jams and breads and right. things like that but i can't get past that texture oh just, yeah just, yeah a lot of people texture. deal with that yeah so that custody texture and that changes as well as they ripen so again you know yeah. like that that kind of ripeness is going to be much firmer so um the the ohio pawpaw growers association uh have a pawpaw ripening chart that was um actually uh, developed by the, the the late terry powell um and that describes uh, changes in appearance and flavor and color and all kinds of other characteristics as the fruit ripen. So if you're interested in that kind of um, continuum, um, that's really interesting to look at. Great resource, as is the OPGA website in, in general. But I would say that the biggest gradients in flavor are more to do with ripeness than to do with, with cultivars, although they, they do vary a lot. Okay, here's a, a long question, and we have a group here from Wisconsin. Okay. They have a nascent pawpaw growers interest group in Wisconsin. Most of us are in USDA 2012 Zone 5A. They are reaching out to folks who have been growing pawpaws in northern areas for some time, 10 to 20 years. She's made contact with a grower who started growing pawpaw in Zone 4B in the late 1990s. They hope to get seedlings from them soon. They would appreciate information on appropriate varieties for our area, tips on getting them established, sources of seeds, saplings, et cetera, and they are looking for organic. Can you guide them to a good resource? <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, so um, there's, you know, there's a lot of variation in um, 
the ripening phenology of the um, of the different varietals. Uh, there are, you know, it's it's kind of it's really early days for varietal production. A lot of them are um, are not specifically bred. A lot of them are actually wild sele wild selections that have then been named. Um, but yes, there is information available on whether they're kind of earlier or, or later. Um, off the top of my head, I would struggle to re recall that, but um, you can see the contact details of our team there. Um, so do feel free to reach out and we can connect you with some of those resources. Again, I would say the Ohio Pawpaw Growers Association or the North American Pawpaw Growers Association is an absolutely fantastic resource with really, really knowledgeable people as, as well. Um, but yet, if you if you get in contact with us by email, that's great. Uh, if you're looking to get hold of varietal trees, um, I don't um, often do plugs, but um, we've worked with um, two main suppliers. There's, there's a whole bunch of them now. Um, England's Nursery in Kentucky. Um, they offer. Uh, they no longer offer um, um, trees, but they do offer scion wood. Uh, so one thing you could think about in northern regions is collecting um, wild seed from from more northerly distributed um, wild stands and then grafting onto to that. That is something we know nothing about. It's like how rootstock affects uh, growth. We don't have clonal rootstock, rootstocks in the way that apples or pears or plums do. Um, so you, you might want to think about doing that. And, you know, and England's will be able to supply you with, with cyan wood and they're great very helpful to talk to about um which varieties you want you're gonna you're probably gonna want some of the earlier bearing varieties so you have time for them to ripen um, the other supplier we use is uh, one green world and they're based out of oregon they supply um container grown trees uh, and they've got a, a really pretty good range of, of varieties available to them now but you, you really want to get in there early and, and plan ahead uh, so talk to those suppliers. One Green World has an excellent website with a lot of information on it about the different varieties. Uh, but and you can also call them up. And they're, they're very helpful. Um, but the, the stuff is, material is just selling out like every year now. Um, so you want to be placing an order now for, for, next, for planting next spring. Okay, a couple final questions, uh, a few comments. You probably haven't looked at the chat, but some great comments in the chat. People have really enjoyed this. And George Hale says that Kylene Hale, NC-1, won first place at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival on Saturday. There you so go. Congratulations. congratulations. That's great news. Yeah, NC-1 yeah. is a really great variety. We have that in our orchard. It's a, a firm favorite of a, of a lot of people. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, is it known how close trees must be for pollination? Good question. Um, <laughs> uh, the recommended spacing for, for orchards, um, I'm trying to recall that now, I believe, oh my goodness. Um, I wanna say that we have um, eight foot between rows and six foot between trees. I might be um, underestimating a little bit now. So that's, and that, but that's more like a, you know, ensuring they don't compete with one another. Kind of thing um that i don't know if you're, if you're talking in the in the wild i mean it's yeah very difficult to say to say um but you know we we don't have any issues with with pollination on, on trees grown in, in those kind of distances apart um but hand pollinating is always good particularly if you've only got a, a couple of trees okay final question is tree height equated to flowering start as in flower start time, um, uh, yeah, okay. So um, tree height is certainly related to the um, number of fat flowers that, that trees produce. We, we do have information on that. I haven't shown it um, today, but uh, so yeah, the flowering effort is obviously strongly related to the final fruit set. And that's a very much a function of tree size. We've done very limited work on phenology. I mean, when I say very limited, I mean none. <laughs> so I can't answer that question uh, uh, at present. But yeah, that would be an, another thing that we're really keen to get into is to understand that the phenology and the, the timing of, of ripening a little bit better. Um, well, this is really exciting and uh, great to know that there's a, a new crop coming in Ohio. Uh, lots of great comments in the chat box. And I'll finish with a, a final story for you, Matt, that you can use in your presentations. Uh, the Ohio Governor's Residence Heritage Garden has some pawpaw trees. 
okay. South, Southeastern Ohio. And uh, First Lady Hope Taft was the one that started the whole Ohio Heritage Garden. And when First Lady Frances Strickland and Ted Strickland was in office, First Lady, uh, former First Lady Hope Taft picked up a uh, roadkill groundhog and took it and presented it to First Lady Frances Strickland. <laughs> and Frances always tells this story and she talks about the fact that Hope presented her with this dead roadkill groundhog and Frances was like, what? Had no idea what it was for, but of course you know what it was for, correct? Yes, for yes. Yes. Eyes, so, uh, told, <laughs> yep, I haven't that, mentioned so. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you knew that story then. Oh uh, yeah. So so we know of, of growers who swear by hanging uh, roadkill <laughs> in the trees, <laughs> be it raccoons, possums, crows, whatever else they can get their hands on, or even fish in their trees. Yep. Um, listen, I'm. <laughs> no one's tested that. Uh, I'm not going to recommend it or, or test it because I was <laughs> significant um, health concerns about having decomposing animals next to sure. people are sure. going to consume. But um, people have suggested that that improves the number of flies. Yeah. In the tree. yeah. So imagine being a first lady and the former first right? lady for some tree with roadkill, right? Yeah, right. That's funny. Yeah. So great, great story. Well, Matt, we really appreciate this. This is really fascinating, just exciting stuff going on. And uh, Brad, Sarah, Joe, they're all great researchers. So good to see that we got a great team working on pawpaws. We thank you all for coming this evening and join our talk tonight. Matt, again, look at the chat box. Look at all the great comments. People really enjoyed it. And we will see you in a month when we talk to uh, our urban forester regarding our urban trees and mental health and all the benefits that we get from urban trees. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thank you month. all for coming. It was a pleasure.